Hi folks, let's talk about floor finishes and specifically how we can get really good floor finishes right off the machine. What we need to know about tooling that we use, the machine that we're using, and the cam strategies. Before we dive into some of the detailed tips and tricks to get the best finish, let's start with the basics of the machine design and tool path. Modern CNC machines are absolutely amazing to the point where it's easy to forget that the laws of physics still apply. As this end mill is traveling along this tool path represented by the blue line, one axis or one motor has to slow down or decelerate as it then navigates through that corner and the other axis comes up to speed. This will put some amount of stress or pressure on the overall machine, the frame, the dovetail gibs, the linear ways, etc. And it's no different than you taking a turn in your car. Modern vehicles have great suspensions, which tend to soak up a lot of that. Nevertheless, if you came up to a hard turn, slammed on the brakes, whipped the steering wheel to the right, you would feel a fair amount of play or motion as you made that turn. Your passengers may also not be very happy with you. This is such a big deal that Fusion and other cam systems give you a specific way to help handle this, which on this 2D contour example, if we hop over to the Passes tab, all the way at the bottom, it's called Feed Optimization. And if we hover the mouse over, specifies that the feed should be reduced at corners. This is helping give your machine a different feed rate, which can help the kinematic impact or the amount of deflection or sway when it changes direction by a certain amount. But I'm gonna guess that most of you probably haven't checked this box because you really don't often need to. Nevertheless, if you have seen healing or those circular rings or whisper marks in the bottom of a part, very often you'll see them at places where the machine had to change directions. So in this sample part here, we're roughing all four pockets with an adaptive. It's worth noting two things. Number one, adaptive is and always will be a roughing strategy. It actually does have the potential to leave a decent floor finish. What makes it the adaptive is varying how much side load it takes. And so you're often not going to get a good sidewall finish, which is why for finishing applications, you want to come back through with a 2D contour for that. The second thing to note about this adaptive strategy, we're plunging it with a four degree ramp tapered angle. This creates a cone shaped entry that really helps with chip evacuation. Now we're just roughing here, so getting the chips out isn't so important like it will be when we're doing the floor finish, but nevertheless, anytime there's a chance to reduce the amount of chips that you recut or change your part strategy or setup to improve chip evacuation, absolutely do it. And I find that this is a feature that's definitely worth leaving on by default. First up is a 2D pocket. We started with this because it's one of the most straightforward options for any sort of floor finishing. And a pro tip for any of these is you don't need to go to the dropdown to reprogram them. If we're using the same tool and the same geometry selection, you can start with that original adaptive, right click, create derived operation, and choose it that way. In this case, that would default to all four chains. So holding down the control key will quickly let you deselect the areas that you don't want. We want to make two modifications to this 2D pocket, which is that we want to get rid of all this air cutting where it's ramping in red, and we want to be deliberate with how we control the tools lead into the material. Because just like we have deflection or tool pressure when we change directions in X, Y, we also will have tool deflection as we plunge into the part or lead into the part in Z. Top height, instead of it being stock top, we're going to do the selected contour with just a very small amount of additional clearance. Click OK, and you'll notice that immediately removes most, but not all of the red rampin. The reason is on the last tab under linking, it defaults to a ramp clearance height of 0.1 inches, which is a mile in the machining world. I often change this to 10 thousandths of an inch, and that should get rid of most of the air cutting. And this sort of a helical rampin can be a very elegant way of entering the material to help give it a smooth lead in with minimal tool pressure and the least chance of it causing any sort of a vibration or healing effect on the face of your end mill that would mar your part. But in the end, 2D Pocket isn't going to be our best option with the caveat that what you're about to see on the tool paths that do give better options could be a way you could modify or run 2D Pocket with reduced step over. So next up is horizontal. Now it's a little bit misleading because horizontal is generally used as a two dimensional tool path. So why isn't it under the 2D menu? It's under 3D because all of the operations in the 3D menu are what are called model aware. And this is where horizontal really shines. 
If I create a new horizontal, I've got a tool selected, I've done nothing else, I'm going to click OK. Fusion's going to analyze the model and it's going to put a toolpath over all horizontal surfaces. This makes any of the 3D toolpaths excellent candidates when you're trying to build out templated workflows to reduce the amount of ground up programming you have to do every time you get a new part. So if you're a job shop or you're rapid prototyping, you're going to want to spend the time to play with the horizontal, turn them into templates to make use of them. I actually don't love horizontal, but horizontal does have one notable win. If you take a look at this toolpath, it doesn't look like a traditional horizontal. Very similar to the 2D Pocket, the difference is it's defaulting to a maximum step over of 30 thousandths of an inch. So really, this is up to the operator, and it's not really any better or worse because it's a direct trade-off of machining time. You'll notice under my name, Preferences Manufacture, I choose Show Operation Machining Time. It tends to be fairly accurate, but more importantly, it shows that this horizontal with a substantial number of step over passes is approximately five times longer than the 2D contour. So it's a better tool path, but at the expense of additional time. The setting that I like in horizontal is this checkbox to used morph spiral. The pop-up box even tells us this can provide a smooth run on the machine. So ultimately, a lot of this comes back to the quality and the rigidity of your machine, the type of material, the amount of tools stick out, just a number of factors. But anything that we can do with the CAM toolpath to help minimize the number of hard right turns, if you compare these two toolpaths, it really shows the difference between the two, can help any machine because it's a never-ending spectrum. You can start with a benchtop machine, a Tormach, a Haas, or move all the way up to some of the highest end machine tools in the world. They are still plagued by these kinematic motion issues. They're not just issues relegated to hobby or home machines. Next up is 2D Contour. Very easy to program, probably a toolpath most folks are familiar with. And again, we've got that ability to adjust the step over to control that as we see fit. And really the differences between these two options are doing just that, adjusting the number of step over passes with one other difference, which is the last 2D contour, we are doing a ramp in. So we're able to edit the linking parameters of that tool to control the ramp degree angle and the ramp degree height. So that tool moves back and forth to again, optimally enter that material and avoid any tool pressure witness marks when we're starting that pocket. And really that ties into some of the troubleshooting style tips if you're struggling with this to think about. Number one, is keep your tool pressure low. And we can minimize tool pressure in two different ways. Number one, minimal axial depth of cut. And number two, anytime we're doing these tool paths on an interior pocket, we're always leaving some amount of radial stock. And what that means is the tool is never actually touching the side of our part. It's only cutting on the face of the tool. The second troubleshooting tip is ensuring our code is as smooth as possible. And there are two different areas we can look at smoothing. First is in Fusion. We have a tab called Smoothing. As an example, we'll duplicate this toolpath, and on the second version, we'll turn off Smoothing. It's going to create more points along our toolpath. And every time you have a point, you have a line of G-code. Every time you have a line of G-code, the CNC machine is sending a change in direction or an updated line to the motors on your machine, which will at some level cause a change in the toolpath. On super high-end machines, we've heard folks talking about being able to actually see these even on incredibly good looking parts uh, because they can tell that kinematic change. So with smoothing, without smoothing, look at the difference in the number of points along that arc. Smoothing comes at the expense of slightly varying the part geometry. Smoothing here is saying, I can delete any point so long as this toolpath remains within 2007 inch. For most of us, that's probably okay. And obviously a parameter that you can adjust as you see fit. And the last tip is the condition of the machine. And that relates to not only the condition of the ways or the dovetailed gibs, the linear rails, but also the level in the tram. The number one issue has to do with head nod. And again, this is not a problem that's relegated to home or hobby machines. It exists on machines of all grades and in old toolmakers tip or trick is to use that head nod that's always going to be there. There's always some amount of tram air. Use it to your advantage. This is why you'll see toolmakers will often only use a tool like a fly cutter in one direction, say left to right or front to back. They're using that head nod or that tram air in their favor. 
The other thing you can do is use smaller tool diameters. The smaller the tool diameter, the less impact any tram error will cause on your part and using smaller step overs, which is what we saw in this part led to higher surface finishes, albeit at the cost of longer run times. The other benefit of smaller diameter tools is lower tool pressure, which minimizes deflection and minimizes tool pressure, which again can cause healing in the part either along the full surface or especially when the machine changes direction. Finally, if this is something that you're looking at for long-term production, you want to get those absolute best looking parts straight off the machine, play with different tools. We used a Lakeshore carbide end mill that we thought gave excellent surface finishes. We've also found that somewhat ironically, the high gullet face tools, which are often used for roughing on sidewalls, can actually give excellent floor finishes as well. So let's try to put some data or science behind these results. First off, there's just a point of pride. It's really nice to get good at surface finishes. And one of the things I've always admired is folks that can take a machine and get the absolute most out of it, which is a combination, again, of not only the CNC machine, but also the way you program your part. Nevertheless, there actually is a reason to know some of the science or data here because if you're doing a downstream process like polishing, lapping, sandblasting, anodizing, uh, anywhere where you're looking for a specific cosmetic look or uh, to specifically avoid tool marks, you want to know what that surface roughness is. And generally speaking, you're going to massively help that downstream process by getting it as good a machined process as you possibly can. Now, oddly, there are some exceptions. Certain things like gasket surfaces actually want a slightly higher roughness average to give them some texture or grit. But a lot of us are looking for that really good finish. So we used a profilometer, which is kind of like a record player where it drags a needle and it measures those peaks and valleys and it gives us a roughness average over a relatively short distance. I find you want to take a few different measurements and you want to make sure you're going perpendicular to the tool path because you can get different results depending on how that needle is being drug across whatever imperfections or floor finish variation there may be. Nevertheless, the profilometer confirms what we thought, which is the tool paths that had shorter step overs that ran longer give us a much lower surface roughness average, often into the high single digits or low double digits. The tool paths with the wider step overs that were quicker or a little bit more aggressive had a higher roughness average. And for fun, we just absolutely goosed it on a separate part. We ran the machine absolutely as hard as we could, kind of trying to show how bad it could look. And it wasn't even that bad as a roughing strategy. You do see those roughness average numbers are in the 120, 130 range. Uh, this can also be really helpful if you're outsourcing parts. If you're working with another machine shop, they may need to know, or you may want to tell them, hey, I have a specific RA value that I want for this certain feature. And if you don't have a profilometer, two things you can do. One is that they sell these surface roughness sort of sample blocks that can give you an idea of what surface roughness is. The second thing is your fingernail is kind of a poor man's uh, surface roughness tester. As you drag a fingernail across those ripples, you can feel them when it starts hitting that 30, 40, 50 value. You can feel that kind of consistent ripple. And on the samples here that had a really low, kind of that nine or 10 roughness average, they're just silky smooth, almost like a piece of glass. So folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.